Today's sermon is His House, My House, Covenant Communion with Christ. His House, My House, Covenant Communion with Christ. And you can see that the title kind of picks up on, as Andrew caught, kind of picking up on the fact that we're back in the sanctuary house of worship, but also we're going to go a little bit deeper than that as well. And certainly the covenant class sharing their first communion and us all coming together for our first communion service here uh, in the restored to really its almost original pristine form our sanctuary i want to again commend our covenant class and all the folks involved the, the teachers the parents the families the households but this brings up this begs the question a question that i talked with our covenant class members about you guys will remember this any of you who met with me most of you met with me um, what is, what is a covenant? What are we talking about when we talk about covenant? And I have to, you guys will admit, pretty much all of you, when I ask you that question, you would kind of stumble around and some of you would say a promise. Some of you said a promise. And uh, it, it's true, it's a promise, but it's a whole lot more. So then we talked, I usually talked with, I pretty much talked with each one of you about this, the point of reference of a marriage being a covenant. Y'all remember this? A marriage is a covenant. So it's not just, a marriage is not just a consumer transaction. It's not just a summer fling. It's not just a, hey, for this part of my life, I kind of like you, I'm willing to be married to you, but you know what, next year or 10 years from now, I may not like you anymore and I may be out of this. Or you know what, I like you tonight, but tomorrow I get more out of going to her place or his place, or I get more out of on Tuesday night doing this or that, or sometimes I like you, sometimes I like somebody else. So a marriage is a covenant, like it's an all-in covenant, uh, not a consumer transaction. We're not just consuming. We're not like consumers at church. You know that we don't shop around churches. I hear sometimes that like non-Christians or unchristian people say, oh, we're shopping around churches. Like, that's not, that's not what Christians do. It's not a con consumer transaction. It's not like, well, I get more out of this. I get more out of that for right now. My kids like this. I like that. It's not a consumer thing. It's a covenant like a marriage, right? It, uh, marriage is not a passing passion. It's not a contract of convenience. And it's not just a promise. Remember how we talked about that? It's not just a promise. A covenant is, and I've got it up here so we can, uh, well, we should have it up here. A covenant is a relationship, number one. Number two, it includes expectations and promises. Not just a promise, but expectations and promises. And number three, faithful follow-through, right? Like, do we actually do the promises? Do we actually meet up with the expectations? Faithful actions. So, we talked about covenants have signs and seals. Remember, like for the marriage, we talked about the fact that you have a wedding. That's a public proclamation and sign and seal of a wedding of people getting married. Remember that? So, and, and then sometimes people celebrate anniversaries too as a sign and a seal of the fact that they're married. They're in a marriage covenant. And then we also talked about rings, right? I pretty much showed most of you my wedding ring. And we talked about how this is a sign and a seal of the fact that I'm married. But if I put a ring on you, does that mean you're married automatically? No, and your parents would probably get really upset if they, if they found out you were married at your age, right? So anyway, probably not a good idea, right? But I could put a ring on you. That doesn't mean you're married. Just like I said, somebody could be baptized but not actually be a Christian, right? And somebody could. We don't, we don't invite them to. We don't want them. But somebody could take the Lord's Supper without being a Christian, right? So the sign doesn't mean the covenant is in effect, but it is a sign. And then this is what I wanna to talk to you about today. In addition to the wedding, and in addition to rings, we also have a house or a household. That's what we're gonna talk about today. So in other words, I could get some two really cool actors up here, like an actor or an actress, and I could say the words of a wedding <laughs> And they could say them, and if they're really good, actor and actress, you might be really into this, right? But then all of a sudden the director says, cut, and they walk on stage, off stage, are they really married? No, right? So this is the, another sign of a real covenant of marriage. A household is made, right? A household is made. And that doesn't just mean a physical house. That means like a, a life together. Like we belong together. We're a household together. 
So this brings us back to being a Christian. What is being a Christian? It's being in covenant communion, like we're united together with Jesus and with each other as a church, right? And it's part of a covenant community, again, the church. So it's not just a promise. It, it includes promises, but it's not just a promise. It's a, remember, a relationship, promises and expectations, and then faithful actions on those promises and expectations. So as Christians, we're under what's called the new covenant. And the Old Testament talks all about this new covenant that's going to come. And the most obvious place you get it, you get it in Isaiah, you get it in Deuteronomy, you get it in the Psalms. But the most obvious place you get it is in Jeremiah chapter 31. Okay? And that's where the Lord says, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers. They won't need to say, know the Lord, know the Lord, because they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will, isn't this a great covenant? I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. Well, I wonder how that new covenant is gonna happen. How could our sins be forgiven? How could we be part of a, a covenant and a household where we really know God personally, like all of us, if we want to? Well, Jesus in the upper room connects the dots for us. Okay, so Jesus in the upper room on the night of the Last Supper, here's what he says when he brings the cup. He says, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood, which I'm shedding for you. Now, remember what we talked about when we got together. I would show you the, the beginning of the New Testament with the title New Testament, and I would say, what is this? It's not just 27 books. It definitely includes the 27 books, speaking of expectations. But we talked about, remember, testament is about the same thing as covenant. Remember that? So when we say we are people who follow the New Testament, we follow the new covenant, right? What Jeremiah was talking about, what God is talking about, the new covenant, the New Testament, what Jesus says, I am establishing now at the Last Supper. I'm about to shed my blood to secure the new covenant, the New Testament. So again, let's think about, let's, what, what does it mean? New Testament. New Testament means a relationship, and that relationship is with Jesus and with his church. For us, it's a church family here together, right? Number two, expectations and promises. In his word, he guides us with the expectations and promises, right? And number three, faithful actions, living as Christians according to his word and faithful to each other in the church, in the church family, and with Jesus. That's the New Testament. That's the new covenant. So this you had to get for the covenant class. You, you really had to know these things, and you knew these things. We have two signs and seals of the New Testament or the New Covenant. What are they? Everybody remember? Baptism, right? And what? Eucharist, you know, the great Thanksgiving, or communion, or the Lord's Supper. All three of those names, right, apply to the other sign and seal of the New Testament or the New Covenant. Now, with that in mind, we're going to turn to our primary scripture for today, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1, and then the close of this passage of scripture you all know I've been preaching on for the second half of the summer called the Sermon on the Level from Jesus from Luke chapter 6. And today, we read through the whole thing last week to kind of begin to wrap up. Today, I'm just going to read Luke chapter 6, verse 46 through 49. If you want to get the whole reading of the whole thing, Go back to last week's sermon. If you missed it, you can pull that up online on YouTube or our Facebook. Last week's sermon, like teacher, like student, because you guys were starting back to school and a whole lot of people are starting back to school. Today, that was based on another verse from Jesus. The student's gonna be like the teacher. Today, his house, my house, covenant communion with Christ. So let's open God's word and continue. Proverbs chapter 14, verse one. The wise woman builds her house. 
Now, you've got to understand this. This is wisdom. And what Jesus teaches is wisdom at the close of the Sermon on the Level. This is not talking about a physical house. It's not about a woman hammering stuff together, putting stone together. It's about a life and a household together. The wise woman builds her house, her marriage, her household, her family. The wise woman builds her house, but the foolish tears it down with her own hands. That's Proverbs 14, verse 1. And now over to the New Testament, to Jesus. Jesus says this as he closes out this great sermon on the level. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Now he's talking to people who claim they're Christians, who, who are his disciples. He said, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a person building a house, there it is again, building a house, who dug deeply and laid the foundation on the bedrock. And when a flood came, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake that house because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them, in other words, doesn't follow my word, is like a person who built a house on the ground without a foundation. And the torrent burst against it, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. His house, my house. Covenant communion with Christ. So just to repeat, a covenant is a relationship. Secondly, expectations and promises and then faithful actions following up on that. We talked already about the signs and seals of a marriage covenant, wedding and rings, but as you know, today what I really want to talk about is household, household. And here, let me take you back to the early in the Bible, the first marriage there ever was. It's Adam and Eve. And here's what we read in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, in other words, he's leaving one household, and a new one's going to start. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's the covenant of marriage. And the covenant means you're going to belong to each other and be true, be true to the marriage communion and to the house, the new house that's being made, okay? A new household, a new family, and a life, a lifelong life together. Now, you know, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1 is, of course, kind of talking about this, about families and about marriages and such. The wise woman builds her house, but the foolish tears it down with her own hands. Now, remember what I said about Adam and Eve, right? Man shall leave his father and mother and be united with his wife. Let's move ahead. When God calls a man named Abram, it's later going to be referred to as Abraham. When he calls him into a new covenant relationship, I want you to catch the way that this is the same kind of language. This is in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and catch this, from your father's house. You guys see that? From your father's house to the land that I will show you. In other words, if you're gonna be in a new covenant with me, through which I'm ultimately gonna bless all the nations of the world and from your seed, everybody, not just people from your direct biological family are gonna have the opportunity for salvation. If we're gonna start this covenant thing up, Abram, you've gotta leave your father's house and belong to me in my house, okay? So I'm, I'm gonna show you where this promised land that I'm gonna bring you to, but you gotta leave your father's house. So here we have it again. Covenant is about household, about a household relationship, expectations and promises and faithful actions. And that brings us to the New Testament, to the New Covenant, the New Covenant household. How does Jesus teach us to pray? How's the way we start off our prayer? Our Father, right? Means we belong to God's household. We're called out of any other household to have our allegiance and our life and build our house in connection with belonging to God the Father, the Father of Jesus Christ. So Jesus teaches us to pray our Father. So being a Christian means 
His house, my house. And then let's go to this closeout of Jesus, the grand conclusion of this sermon that he gives. He says, everyone who, number one, comes to me, number two, hears my words, and number three, does them. Let me repeat that. Comes to me, hears my words, and does them. One, two, three. It's like a person building a house who dug deeply and laid the foundation on the bedrock. So let's look at what Jesus is saying here. Number one, commit. Commit. Number two, comprehend. And number three, construct. Commit, comprehend, and construct your house within his house. So again, just to make this really clear, number one, commit. Everyone who comes to me, you have to make a decision and God in his sovereign grace actually calls you, we believe, to come to him, right? To come to Jesus. That's number one, a commitment. Number two, Jesus says, here's my words. Now, he just doesn't just mean, well, I showed up at church and I kind of heard some stuff, but I don't remember what they said. What the pastor preach on yesterday? What'd you learn in Sunday school yesterday? I don't know, I forget that kind of stuff. No, 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 when he says here, akuate, he's talking about actually like taking it in and remembering it. So comprehend. Comprehend, here's my words. And number three, constructs. It kind of doesn't matter if you can spout out all the Bible knowledge I've ever heard of, but you don't actually do anything on it, right? It's not actually changing you and making a new house. So construct does them like a person building a house. Let's look at this now. Number one, commit. Commit to his household. Jesus' New Testament communion and community he lifted up his eyes on his disciples. He's talking to his disciples. But bear in mind, he's saying, among people who call themselves my disciples, among Christians, there are gonna be some who build the right kind of house and some who don't. They all look the same, usually. They wear the same kind of clothes, they may hang out with the same friends. But some, when the challenges of life come and ultimately when the judgment comes, some will have a house that's built on the foundation of God's word in Jesus Christ, the covenant, and some will not. So Jesus lifts up his eyes on all his so-called disciples <laughs> and says, blessed are you who are the poor, those among you who are the poor, because yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when people hate you and exclude you on account of the son of man. Now this is hard stuff for sixth and seventh graders, and actually for big people too. Jesus is calling us to be poor to the world and instead to treasure him and his house. And that means I may not be popular with everybody if I stick with Jesus. I have to decide, right? Jesus says I'm, I may not get everything that I want to grab in life, but I'm willing to be poor and treasure his things. I'm willing to be unpopular with some people and maybe with some crowds even. I'm willing to be excluded because of him. So that's, that's his message, commit. He says, if you come to me, that means you're, by definition, coming away from some people. Like you're making a choice, okay? So commit, come to, come to me, he says. And then he says, comprehend. He says, he calls us to hear his words and to understand truth and consequences. And here's the reality. My actions show my truth. My actions show who I really am. I can say all the right words, I can dress up nicely, I can act like I'm, you know, all good. My actions reveal, just like Jesus says also in this sermon, you know everybody by their fruit. You know them by their fruit. So I either have communion with the world or with Jesus in faithfulness to him. Jesus says, give, and it will be given to you. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you, both when your crises come in this life and at the judgment. And then Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do what I say? Which brings us number three. We're gonna have to follow through on this and construct, build a house, like build a life that belongs to Jesus. So I wanna build my house, and I invite you guys and all of us to build our house within Christ's house on the bedrock of his covenant word. A wise woman builds her house the right way. A person, Jesus says, 
who comes to me and actually does what I say is like a person building a house laid on the foundation of the bedrock. So what, is, what are we talking about? Well, you know what, I'm gonna go back and cover one thing that's really well known from this sermon that's also in something else called the Sermon on the Mount over in Matthew. And this is the golden rule. You guys ever heard of the golden rule? But here, I wanna give you a span of understanding the golden rule. So because like, if you do the golden rule, that's a way of building your house to use gold by the golden rule, by the way you act, right? But there are other kind of things you can do too. So have you guys ever heard of the wooden rule? The wooden rule, you know what the wooden rule is? The wooden rule is do to others as what? They do to you. You're mean to me, I'm gonna be mean to you. You're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. That's the wooden rule. Basically, you know what, when you guys, when I was three years old, I could, I could operate on the wooden rule, right? And then the advanced wooden rule is this. I do to you as I imagine you might do to me. So if I think you may turn on me, I'll go ahead and turn on you in advance. If I think you're gonna lie about me in the future, I'll go ahead and lie about you right now. If I think you might steal my lunch tomorrow, I'm gonna go ahead and steal your lunch today. That's the advanced wooden rule. Does anybody want to construct your life and go into eternity based on the wooden rule? I don't want to go to the wooden rule. I don't know about you guys. I just don't like it. But a lot of people do that. A lot of our politicians do that even to this day. Like big people, not three-year-old, like uh, 73 and 83-year-old people do that kind of stuff too. Okay, that's the wooden rule. Now let's go to the iron rule. This one's a little more advanced, right? You've got to be a little bit bigger, maybe like a four or five-year-old to pull this one off. Do to others whatever you want whenever you can get away with it. Whenever you have the power, do it. This is the mantra of like dictators and people who crime bosses and gang leaders and everybody else. This is the iron rule, but not just gang leaders. Actually, maybe people in public school and at Starkville Academy do this kind of stuff too. This is called the iron rule. If I can get away with it, I'm gonna hit you. If I can get away with it, I'm gonna make fun of you. If I can get away with it, I'm gonna exclude you. That's the iron rule. A lot of people in the world operate under those rules and build that kind of house. Do you want your house to be that house, the iron rule? Okay, then let's go to the silver rule. Now this is much more advanced. A lot of the better so-called religions of the world and philosophies follow this. This is the silver rule. And let me go ahead and fill in the blank for you. Do not do to others what you do not want them to do to you. The Buddha, the Buddha, you know, he said, you know, Buddhism, the Buddha said, whatever is disagreeable to yourself, do not do unto others. Confucius in the Analects, Analect 15, 23 says this, what you do not want done to yourself, do not do to others. And Rabbi Hillel, the greatest of the ancient rabbinic teachers of Judaism, who lived about 100 years before Jesus, he put it this way, he said, the law is summed up in this. What is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. This is the whole Torah. The rest is commentary, go and learn. Now notice this, the silver rule is just kind of like a barrier. Don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. And notice too that Rabbi Hillel, the greatest of the Judaic uh, rabbi teachers in the ancient world, he said to your neighbor, that doesn't mean to everybody. That just means to fellow Jews, okay? Now then, let's go to Jesus. Jesus says, as you wish that other people would do to you, do likewise to them. And let me clarify this. Jesus uses a term here, anthropoi, which means all humanity. They don't have to be your neighbor. They don't have to have your same skin color. They don't have to be people that you hang out with and like. Jesus says even people that nobody else likes, you go ahead and affirmatively do for them what you would wish that they would do for you. That's called the golden rule. Do you wanna build your house with gold like from Jesus? That's the question we all have to ask and that's what we live out. We're called to be children of God's house and Jesus calls us to the Father's self-giving, mercy, love, and mission. Mission, proactive mission for other people. Today, I wanna to invite you to receive communion. 
bread, wine, and blessing from the new covenant king and priest, that's Jesus, he is the faithful son over God's house. Now back to Genesis. When that guy I mentioned named Abram or Abraham, after he defeated the kings of the east, he has this really interesting rendezvous with two totally different kind of kings, like the king of the world and worldly power, who's the king of Sodom, and another king who like, comes out of the blue in the Bible, we've never heard of him before, named Melchizedek. This is in Genesis chapter 14. And Melchizedek, his name means king of righteousness. And he's also called the king of Salem or Salem, which means king of peace. He's a Gentile. He's not you know, related to Abraham apparently, but he's, he's listed and introduced as a priest of El Elyon, God most high, which means like the real God. And this priest named Melchizedek, he comes out in the valley, the valley of Shaveh, and he meets Abram, and he serves him bread and wine and blesses Abram. Bread and wine, right? So what does that remind us of? The Lord's Supper, right? And Abram pays a tithe in submission to this guy named Melchizedek. Well, then, you know, the question kind of is later on in the Bible, are the priests always going to be from the house of Aaron? And are we always going to be under the old covenant and its sacrificial system? And the answer is no. And actually, in First Samuel, a man of God makes this pronouncement that the house of Aaron is going to be replaced. And, and, and then in Second Samuel, you read about the fact that God is going to establish a princely uh, kingdom house for the line of David and that some son of David is gonna establish a house that's forever. And in the midst of all of this, it's really interesting. Um, David says this in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 19, after God promises him this house that's gonna last forever. He says, yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. You have spoken also of your servant's house for a great while to come, and this is instruction. You know what the Hebrew there is, Torah? It's like Torah, you know, like instruction, the law. This is instruction for, listen to this, ha-adam. That means everybody, the entire of humanity, not just the Jews. This is a covenant instruction for all people, from all races, from all backgrounds. It's an amazing passage from 2 Samuel 7, 19. And this then leads us to what the New Testament is talking about. When the New Testament wraps all this together that I've been introducing you to today, it's like there's a new covenant, a new testament, with a new priest, a priest who lasts forever, from a different house in the order of Melchizedek. And when we come to the Lord's table today, we're coming to his house and making allegiance to his house. And we belong to the king, Jesus. He's the priest and the king. And his house, which connects with God's eternal house, is forever. So this is what it says, Hebrews 3 Verse 6, we did this in the call to worship, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast. That's the follow through. That's the action on the covenant. If we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. For it is witnessed of him, Hebrews 7 says, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. We're under a better covenant. This is awesome. Hebrews 8, verse 1. Now, the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven, his house, my house. Isn't this awesome? When you are receiving communion today, you're ultimately receiving it from Jesus, who is at the right hand of the Father on high from the heavenly home. That's great.